So be healed. We're talking about redeeming your past and reclaiming your future. That's the tagline of this because we're not talking about just a, a moment of healing. We're not talking about just physical healing, like that physical healing, which we certainly are going to talk about. But we're more than just physical beings, are we not? So God certainly cares about our bodies. because He's a God who carry, cares about every single piece of us. But we're also talking about the fact that we're social beings. We also want to acknowledge the fact that we are all very emotional beings. That we're very relational beings. Every single person here is in some sort of a relationship at any given point, are we not? We're also spiritual beings, and we have longings in our heart and our soul, and we have longings for purpose and calling and creativity. And we have a God that cares about every aspect of our lives. A God who says complete healing, complete redemption for what is broken in your life, that is what I am promising through my love. That is the result of my outpouring, is what Jesus says, is you can be healed. So Jesus himself, right? This is the bold claim of Jesus that we all as humanity can be healed. He came to earth. He embodied a broken individual, a vulnerable human. And then you guys know the story, even if you're in church or out of church, that somewhere along the way, Jesus lives this perfect life and he dies and he rises again so that that brokenness and that disunity and that dysfunction of the world and in our lives might be fully healed, might be fully repaired. And so Jesus himself, his kind of manifesto, as you will, uh, as he stepped onto the stage of his earthly ministry, came from a prophetic word that was given in Isaiah that said this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came, he said, I've come to comfort everyone who's mourning. I've come to bring joy and praise instead of despair. I've come to bring about renewal and fullness of life. And his desire was to do that, to, to step onto the stage of, of his earthly ministry and to do that in such a way that he was going to, to deliver this freedom, deliver this renewal, and deliver this new creation through you and me, through his sons and daughters, through normal human beings who call upon the name of the Lord. He says, I want to set you free. I want to heal you. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. And even when you're in the midst of the process of figuring it out. So if that's you right now, you're in the midst of the process of figuring it out. He says, still in the midst of your messiness, still in the midst of your process, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you can also participate in that healing and giving it away to other people. So while I am in the process of filling you with freedom and love and healing, you are going to also be giving away through me my freedom and love and healing to other people. Because it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. It's for freedom for yourself, that's why he set you free. And it's for freedom for every single person is why he has set us free. And that freedom is not just a moment. Okay, I want us to get that this morning if we, we, as we're coming into this series of what it means to be healed. That it's, it's not just a moment where um, becoming a Christian or accepting that kind of freedom is just like get out of jail free card. Like, oh, I got the stamp of approval now, and so I, I get out of jail free. But actually, that, that freedom is a doorway to a lifestyle. It's an, it's an invitation into life in all its fullness. And a huge part of that, that freedom and fullness is going to be freedom from sin. So I do want to talk about that initially, and we'll talk about it throughout. It's that, that breaking of the bondage that comes along with having sin in our life. And I, and I mentioned sin, and I'm sure that, that bubbles up all kinds of feelings, whether it's of guilt or shame or annoyance, or it means nothing to you. But look, we all have it. All, on some level, we all have missed the mark. All of us, on some level, have gotten to a place where we're not even living up to our own desires that we set for ourselves, much less list, living up to the desires of the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus comes in and he says, I'm going to heal the brokenness that's inside of all of you. I want to heal that place inside of you that is longing just for, for a fresh start. I want to heal that place inside of you that's just longing for forgiveness, that wants to know that you're still accepted, that place inside of you that is longing for a cleansing. And then he says, you know what? I'm also going to remove the penalty of that sin in your life as well as a free gift. And look, I recognize I'm not going to oversimplify this idea of sin. I understand it's really complex. There's a lot of areas in our hearts. Some of them we're, we're free to confess. Some of them are areas that are really covered up because some of those areas are affected by our past. So it's not just things that we've done in our past, but they're things that have been done to us. There's some, some areas in our life that are affected and broken and just don't seem um, to be in line with what we're reading in Scripture because of the way we were raised. 
because of actually institutions or places that we actually found ourselves growing up in, choices that we actually had nothing to do with. And other times there are things that choices that we very much had things to do with that have set us on a course that has gotten us on the wrong path. And then during all of that, there's a spiritual battle that's going on with an enemy that's seeking to steal and destroy the goodness of your heart, to deceive you into giving your heart to things that don't really matter that much. And those are the kind of things that we're going to be unpacking in this series, talking about being healed. But I also want to say, especially today, that while the gospel certainly is about being healed and set free from sin, it's not only about being healed from sin. There's also a huge part of the gospel, which means good news, the story that we're reading of Jesus. A huge part of the gospel is also about power. It's also about praise. It's also about justice in our world. It's also about the relationships that we have. It's also about the new creation that is possible in our lives. You see, as you begin to open yourself up to this more, and it's my prayer for us as a church, as we begin to dive into the pages of Scripture and immerse ourselves in it, we'll see that the God of the universe is not just interested in a moment of forgiveness for you, but he truly is promising life in all its fullness. So just a few, a few verses I want to point out that I've been, I've been pondering on this. This life in all this fullness and the approach that we take, take for and the way we're looking at it. John, John 4, right? There's a story of a woman. Maybe if you know the story, it's often called the woman at the well. And she's, been, um, she's had five marriages. And she's, in the meantime, none of them have gone, wrong, uh, gone right. They've all kind of gone wrong. So now she has a boyfriend. And she's just given up on the marriage thing. It seems she's just living with her boyfriend now striving and looking for a purpose and meaning and apparently looking for it in love and relationships and it's not working out. And Jesus meets her and says this, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And what Jesus is doing right there is declaring that those who give themselves to him will receive a living water, which is in reference to the spirit of God himself. And that that living water will keep them from ever being thirsty again in their life. It will keep them from being driven and ruled by these unsatisfied desires that we all crave. And not only that, but notice this, but that water will become a spring that wells up or is bubbling up to eternal life. So what does that mean? That means that it won't just satisfy the person who receives that water, but it will overflow. It will overflow from your life, and that water is the Spirit. So in John 7, Jesus talks about this again. He doesn't just leave it as a one-time thing for this woman. He brings it up in John 7, three chapters later. And he's directly talking again about the Holy Spirit and that gift. And he says this, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. See, what we're given here through the words of Jesus is that there's this picture of living water that is overflowing from the center of a believer's life. So if you, if you become a Christian, you call on the name of Jesus, there is this center of your life that begins to overflow, and it overflows to a world that is thirsty and craving and hungry and needing to be healed. Because, of course, later, all, all throughout the New Testament, actually, we're given instruction, and we learn about the Holy Spirit, and we understand the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are given to the church. Why? Well, it just says simply in Scripture, for the building up of the common good for the building up of the body, for the encouraging of one another. One of Paul's greatest prayers is is that believers would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that they may be filled with all the fullness of God by the power at work within us that is able to accomplish abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. Peter, another apostle, talks about this. He goes, anybody who's loving and trusting Jesus, they are to rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. And what, what a beautiful sign of someone who is just in love and trusting in Jesus that you can, you can rejoice. But he says this, do it with a mutual, genuine love that is pouring from your hearts. Pouring from your heart, this idea again, this pouring out from your hearts. But then he also throws this as part of this process. He throws this in in chapter 2 of St. Peter. He says, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit because of this. Rid yourselves of hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. So I just wanted to pull from a few places to talk about this very thing, this idea of a process that goes along with this idea of filling and it overflowing to people. Our process of salvation, our process of being healed as a people, as an individual, but also as a church and a community, which of course we all need, is a process. And the recognition of the process is really important. It's ongoing, it's active, and it's not done in our own power. It is only done through the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work within us. 
And so this, this process often gets referred to uh, in Christian terms as spiritual formation or even discipleship. Paul, Paul puts it in these terms in Philippians. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. This is something that God actually partners with us in and that we're called to actively participate in with him. And so what we're going to explore in the next few months is that interplay of our responsibility, right, which requires our repentance, which requires our following, our stepping in, our working out of our salvation. But how does that work alongside God's sanctification and God's purification and God wanting to fill and empower with his Holy Spirit at the same time? Because God is breaking into the world. That's my son, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Already, this is a brokenness. He's trying to interrupt. The sinful nature is strong. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. You know, that's okay. There is freedom and healing for him as well. But that's what God's doing, right? He's breaking in in power. That's the promise of Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom has come near. So repent. And I think we as a church, we're calling even this today's talk as we step in, is like the healing of our expectations and healing of expectation. And that's because I think we as a church need to reclaim and set our expectation on that again. That we need to reclaim the declaration of Jesus that he has come so that we may have life in all its fullness. Amen? And in that, also recognize that that, that, that fullness of life that he's talking about is an actual way of life. Right? It's not just a statement. It's a way of life he's talking about. I think there's so many Christians in this world who are living jaded spiritual lives because of misplaced expectations in their life. They've looked at this, this single moment of uh, forgiveness or the single moment of salvation where they receive the forgiveness of sins and they've seen that as the end game instead of as the starting blocks. See, life in all its fullness is a way of life. And that way of life is a holy life. It's a life that's set apart and it's different than the life that this broken world tells us that we can live to find fullness of life. I love how Dallas, Dallas Willard explained this by looking at a Christian bumper sticker that if you find yourself in the Bible Belt, sometimes you might be able to see this around everywhere. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I'm not knocking on my brothers and sisters in the Bible Belt. It's great. But this bumper sticker, I'm busting on a little bit. The bumper sticker says, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Now, of course, that's a true, true statement, right? Obviously, if you've ever met a Christian, you know they're not perfect. Nobody's claiming perfection here. And of course, Christians are absolutely forgiven. That's the wonderful thing about the grace of Jesus. But there's an underlying truth in this statement that I think exists in uh, this bumper sticker that I'll just use the words of Dallas when he said this. What the slogan really conveys is that forgiveness alone is what Christianity is all about. What is genuinely essential to it. It says that you can have a faith in Christ that brings forgiveness, while in every other respect your life is no different from that of others who have no faith in Christ at all. And don't we see that just so obvious today? Christians and non-Christians are both crippled by stress, plagued with anxiety and anxiety attacks, attacks right? Christians and non-Christians are both driven by this like, relentless desire to need to succeed. Divorce rates in marriages are actually very much the same between someone who claims faith and someone who does not claim faith in God. Finances, the way we spend our money, even the time we spend in our social lives, the activities that we participate in, the way we care for the marginalized, the way we look out for the poor, the, the TV shows that we watch on TV, the time that we spend, very much looks the same between a Christian and non-Christian. Why is that? I think because of that, inside both Christians and non-Christians, there still tends to be this great deep desire for greater healing and for a life truly that's a life in all its fullness. Where is that? I want that. And it's for that reason that we need to realize that complete freedom and complete healing in Jesus is not just found in an intellectual decision. Okay, this freedom that we're talking about, this life in all its fullness, is not going to be found just in you fully being able to articulate and intellectualize the truth claims that are in the word of God, even though, of course, we're going to teach into that and study that. But just intellectualizing it and knowing the truth claims of the gospel will not fully set you free. It's understanding and knowing those and then taking a posture. It's all about surrender. So it's not an intellectual decision, rather, but it's a heart posture of surrender. It's about a giving your heart and then, in turn, giving your life over to Jesus. Because 
Ultimately, what we'll always say, and it always is, it is absolutely about love. And think about it. If you love someone, I love my wife. I love my little baby son. And because of that, I, I actually change my actions. I form my life around it. I do things differently because of that love. Jesus says time and again through the scriptures, if you love me, then obey my commands. And that's not because he's some dictator who has all this set of rules. It's because the way of Jesus is the way of love. And in following that way, you will find fullness of life. So that way of Jesus is what we call, um, in Christian terms, again, like we said, it's not just spiritual formation, or we also call it discipleship. And you're familiar with this term, right? It carries its own stigmas with us in the Christian world. One way we like to articulate discipleship in this church is simple. We, we say three things. It's, it's be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. And so first, our first call always will be that we need to just be with Jesus. Because remember, it's all about love, so it's just all about relationship. And how do you have relationship with someone if you're never together? So the first call is be with Jesus. Find yourself in his presence because in his presence, you find fullness of life. It's in, your, in his presence that you realize that you're loved. It's in his presence that you, that you get filled up. It's in his presence that you receive forgiveness, that you, you receive gifts, and that you are healed often. Uh, one way we're doing that, it's really an ongoing thing to find yourself in his presence all the time. But we as a church are also recognizing we want to continually position ourselves in such a way, even institutionally, to have more of that. So part of that's part of the reason we're doing this worship and prayer thing on Friday night. And then actually even starting next week, just a small step, sim simply as we can as our church, we're doing a midweek worship and prayer right in the middle of the week. So Wednesdays at noon. It's in Long Island City. It's the space that we have. And we're opening up for anybody who, who finds themselves in a place or a time where you want to come in and find yourself with other believers to seek the presence of God. Because in his presence, you find fullness of life. And then the second thing, once you find yourself in the presence of God, you want to become more like Jesus. And what does that mean? That actually means, like we talked about, a reordering of your life. That actually means some repentance, right? Turning from what is bad and choosing to go forward for what is good. And we often say repentance. Repentance doesn't mean just like saying no to bad things. It means saying yes to a different way of living. It's choosing to live in a different way. Allowing your life from the inside to start to resemble on the outside the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, kindness. Can you say that about yourself? Those begin with decisions to choose to live in a different way. And remember, we're not doing that on our own. We're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit who wills and works within us to bring about those good works. And then lastly, discipleship or this formation process where you say is, then we, we do what Jesus did, which is the really exciting part. That, this is the part where the living water now that is inside of you, that has cleansed you, begins to bubble over. It's where we participate in the healing of the world. That's where we as a people, as a church, get to participate in justice and mercy and healing and forgiveness and generosity. We get to create new things. We get to rebuild what was once broken. We get to participate in the doing of what Jesus did. And so I was thinking, like, what's the best way to kind of articulate this or get out, get at this? And I think, well, why not just go to one of Jesus' most prolific sermons that in particular talks about this way of Jesus, this, this discipleship, this living the way of Jesus, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Now, of course, we're not gonna we're not gonna go through the entire Sermon on the Mount and work through it right in this moment, but I want to talk about it in terms of broad strokes. But also when we do read it, when you do study it, and I'm encouraging you this week in particular to actually go to that sermon and read it with a, a kind of posture in your heart to, to talk about, okay, God, what kind of a living are you calling me into? And realize that this sermon is not just some kind of broad strokes idealism, but it's actually a pathway to freedom. It's actually a pathway to holy living. And so my hope is that we begin to approach these words of Jesus in such a way that he reveals his heart for our lives. Because it's in this sermon in particular that Jesus is elevating righteousness. But he's elevating righteousness by doing it from the inside out. So whatever your perspective, especially in that time, whatever the perspective of morality and ethics were, he wanted to flip that upside down. And he's saying it's not about this outside-in approach. It's not about doing just a bunch of rules that you need to follow. And if you do just enough of those rules, if you do it just right, if you are just good enough, then you're all good and you're, you're, you're going to be fine. You're going to be healed and you're going to live this fullness of life. No, he's saying, no, look, it's not about this outside-in approach. It's all about your heart. It's about an inside-out approach, which is why he says, for example, it's not about just do not murder, but he says, don't get angry. Don't hold rage and bitterness in your heart towards someone else, even if you're abstaining from murder itself. 
He's saying don't just com- not commit adultery, but he says don't lust. Because the primary concern is your heart. The primary concern is the state of your, whole, your entire soul. That's what Jesus is always after. It's like he's saying, what, what good is it for you to abstain from the outside if your inside is still dark and black? So I'm not saying uh, self-control is worthless. I'm not saying, if so go ahead, then if it doesn't matter, go out and sin and do whatever you want. But I am saying self-control doesn't set you free. Self-control and abstaining from the outside in doesn't set you free if your inside, if your heart and your mind are still being held captive by darkness. And Jesus said, I'm coming so that all could be healed, so that we all could be completely set free. So we see in the opening of the Sermon on the Mount as um, what he's doing is flipping expectations from the very beginning. And I will talk a little bit about the beginning because it's this flipping of expectations that sets the tone for the whole thing. Right? Right? The world's thinking says, who's blessed? Happy people are the blessed ones, right? The rich people are the blessed ones. People who are strong, who have opportunity, who are successful, those are the people that get to be blessed in this world. But Jesus flips that on its head and he says, no, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. What Jesus is doing, he's saying, I'm coming in and I'm lowering, lowering the bar for entry. So whatever you're holding in your mind for who gets to live the blessed life, I'm lowering that bar right now. I'm lowering the bar for entry. He says, from the beginning, my blessing and my favor is for every single person. My blessing and my favor is for the least likely people that you're holding in your mind right now. Or if that's you, my blessing is for you. My blessing is for the broken. My blessing is for the discarded. My blessing is for those who are misguided, who have been abused and used. My blessing is for the poor, the poor literally and the poor in spirit. God, through this sermon, is beginning to say, look, I'm lowering the bar for entry into the kingdom. I'm lowering that barrier of entry that this culture is telling you is the barrier for entry. It's lower than ever before. And the only fee, the only, the only thing that, that is standing in your way, I'm going to take that on too. Through my death and resurrection, I'm taking away. There's like no cover charge, right? It's like the best club in the city and there's no cover fee. But then what he does, interestingly enough, after he's lowered the bar for entry, with the rest of the sermon, he raises the bar on the way you're supposed to live. Did you catch that? He raises the bar on righteousness. He raises the bar on what it means to live the way of Jesus. So he's saying, I'm not just talking about don't commit adultery. I am talking about don't lust. I'm talking about your heart and your soul. I'm not talking about just murder. I'm actually talking about anger and rage and jealousy and hate. I'm telling you to love your enemies. I'm telling you to turn the other cheek. And through this picture uh, in the sermon, we get the way of Jesus. And there's something I think that's just really interesting on on the actual placement of this sermon in particular in the book of Matthew, like where Matthew, the writer, as he's putting it, like puts it in placement of a progression of Jesus' ministry. So what Matthew does is he, what happens right before the Sermon on the Mount is we have this story where Jesus is out in the wilderness and he's being tempted by Satan. He's being tempted by the enemy. And And he steps into that wilderness experience filled with the Holy Spirit because he was baptized, right? He was baptized first. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. And the father says, you know, you're my son. who I'm well pleased. And he goes into the desert and he's tempted by the enemy. But then he comes out of the desert now after overcoming that temptation, fully walking in the power of the Holy Spirit now, teaching and proclaiming. What does he say? He says, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is at hand, depending on your translation. And he says, repent and believe the good news. And then he recruits his 12 disciples, and they start to follow him. And then he starts doing what? He starts healing the sick. He starts doing these miraculous works of Jesus. And then that's where we get, he's getting popular, of course, because he's doing miracles. So he goes up to this mountain, and he starts to teach people, and that's where we have the Sermon on the Mount. And you have this section of the Sermon on the Mount, right? The way of Jesus, the way to live, this teaching where he's elevating the righteousness. But then right after this sermon, in chapter 8, we see Jesus show up again. But now he's down back in the towns again, and he's healing again. He heals a leper, right? He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He, he heals a centurion's servant. And what we're seeing is that the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching of the way of Jesus, the teaching of the kingdom of God is sandwiched right there in the middle between amazing stories of the miraculous and the powerful works of Jesus. The way of Jesus is sandwiched on either side by the works of Jesus. And there's a pastor that once said, which I completely resonate with, is that we as a people love the works of Jesus, And we also uh, many times love the words of Jesus, but we're not so keen on the way of Jesus. Right? We love his words. We do. We love when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. 
We love in that moment when there's a woman uh, caught in adultery and he says, you cast the first stone if you have sin in your life. Don't have sin in your life, right? We love that. We love how he's calling out religious hypocrisy all the time and we should love that. And we also love the works of Jesus. How can you not? He feeds the poor. He lets blind people see. He heals lepers. So he's restoring people not only physically, but he gives them their humanity back. He's a God of healing. He's a God of justice. He's a God of miracles. He's a God of deliverance. We love the words. We love the prophecy. We love the works of Jesus. When it comes to the way of Jesus, we're often like, well, I'm not so sure. When it comes to the the idea of dying to ourselves, to taking up our cross and following him, when it comes to doing the hard work of ridding ourselves of selfish ambition and sinful desires, when it comes to actually making an intentional choice for sexual purity that doesn't really fit within the context of 21st century America. When it comes to trusting that God is the one who gives and takes away, and therefore giving of our first fruit of finances over to him is truly an act of sacrifice and worship, that when he says 10%, he means 10% as a starting point, and to take him at his word. When it comes to forgiving people, not just the people we love that hurt us and do uh, harmful things to us, but actually forgiving our enemies, forgiving people that we honestly don't even like that much and that truly do not deserve the forgiveness. When it comes to living out the way of Jesus, many of us are not as zealous about that. Many of us are not quite so sure. But what we're seeing in the book of Matthew here, with this sandwich of the works of Jesus on either side of the amazing, uh, on, or the, the works of Jesus that are on either side of the, the way of Jesus, is that we are seeing that we cannot have the works of Jesus, the prophetic, the miraculous, the beautiful, the wonderful. And we can't have the words of Jesus, the prophetic, the truth, the truth claims that we all love, and hope to walk in any kind of authority whatsoever in them without living out the way of Jesus ourselves. Because the authority for the works of Jesus and the words of Jesus are backed up by him living out the way of Jesus. And the same is true for us today. But don't get me wrong on this. We are all blessed. We are all filled. Remember, Jesus was was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit before he did any of these amazing things. Before he set out onto his ministry. God said, you are my son, who I'm well pleased. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But then he went out into the desert. And what he did did do there when he confronted the enemy, what he did is he chose the way. He chose the way of God, not the way of temptations in the enemy. And what we see flow from that is that Jesus leaves the desert, not only filled with the Holy Spirit as he was when he went in, but as we read in Luke, he left the desert. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. He came in filled, but he left in the power. There's a, a story in Acts 19 that I just wanted to pull out and share just like a little piece of it. We're actually probably going to get into Acts 19 later in this series in more depth. But there's a story here that I think really fits of this group of men who are trying uh, to kind of work out this thing that we're talking about. They are trying to function in the works of Jesus without themselves living out the way of Jesus or having any kind of personal relationship with Jesus themselves. Because remember, the way of Jesus is all about the heart. It's about being in relationship with Jesus. That's what we're talking about, in his presence, in love with him, and through through that love that we have with him, in that holy life that we're living, he he propels us by the power of his Holy Spirit to live out the way of Jesus. But here we are in Acts 19, we read this. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. You see what they're doing there? They are basing their authority, not in the name of God whom they had devoted themselves to, but they're like doing it vicariously through, through Paul and his faith or these things that they'd heard about. It said seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. I just wanted to share a couple of things. It's a great story. Yeah, welcome to church. I, I, I'm so filled with life, what God is doing. There's so many beautiful stories pouring in. There's so many amazing things that God is doing. And I know there is a hunger for more. Or there is a curiosity for what else is there. We are in the midst of God moving. He is here. He is present. We are thankful for this church and we are thankful for the love of Jesus. And we all want more, do we not? But that more will come, not from some moment, not from some person, 
But when that moment, that moment for more, that desire for more, that breaking into the kingdom will come when we as the church begin to live out and walk the way of Jesus. When we live repentant and surrendered lives, as you walk out the way of Jesus, then where you grow in authority to be able to live and function in the works of Jesus. And look, God is great. He's going to give gifts. He is a merciful Savior. He's the one who always, like, we, we give him a little, and he, like, just lavishes us with a ton. Like, his default is mercy. His default is to lavish you with more. And I don't know about you, but, but, but why I'm here is because I want to see a move of God in this city. I want to see a move of God come and break in and transform my friends' lives, transform lives of people I don't even know yet. I want to see love and mercy reign over this city. I want to see a move of God of repentance and purity and freedom spread across the West. Our heart's desire is for revival. But if you look at the stories actually of revival historically, of these great moves of God that we have seen happen historically, that none of them seem to last. Have you noticed that? that? There are always these stories that we tell of these great past moves of God. At some point, those moves kind of fall apart. And it's because I don't know, I don't fully understand, but for whatever reason, God chooses to work through partnership. And somehow, therefore, without our surrender, without our surrender, with our willingness to actually step in and to participate, to walk that holiness of life, to step into the righteousness of Jesus, then revival just turns into this moment where there's this really cool experience with the Holy Spirit that didn't create any kind of human response whatsoever. But the, the words and the works of Jesus demand a response from us in our lives. And the pathway to those works, to that breaking in, to that more that you're wanting in your life, the fullness of life that you're longing for, that fullness of life that we're longing for in the city begins with intimacy with you and Jesus first. The pathway for freedom, the pathway for more healing, for more healing in your life and the more healing for God to go and do that through you, which is so cool, for physical healing, for emotional healing, for healing in your relationships, so spiritual healing from those areas that you've been damaged. It's through loving and knowing Jesus and walking in the way of his if we love him, Jesus says, what do we do? We obey his command. We live as he called us to. However, I do want to point this out because I don't want it to become like this idea of like white-knuckling morality kind of teaching. What are his commands? What is that way of Jesus? What is that way of life that we're talking about? It's not just a list of rules. It's not just a picture. So if you're holding your picture right now that I'm needing to be this, this conscientious person who's doing really hard, trying not to break their rules and doing your best to learn more about God, get rid of that picture. The picture of living in the way of Jesus is someone who is active. It's, it's walking in the miraculous. It's walking in a miraculous way of living. There's nothing more miraculous than saying, I'm going to choose to live for a different kingdom than as opposed to the ways of this world. There's nothing more miraculous than being a person of love and forgiveness in this world. Because remember, it's an active way of living. Jesus called the very first disciples. And what's the first thing he said to them to do? He didn't give them a list of rules. He said, come, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to send you out into a radical way of life that you will never believe, that you would never have planned for yourself. Right? The Beatitudes, the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that we talked about. Right after that moment, after he flips the script, Jesus says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. That means you. It means you. You are the salt of the earth. And what does the salt do? He goes, that you, I'm choosing you to bring out flavor. I'm choosing you to bring out nuance and depth of my creation. And he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He says, he says you, your call, anyone here who calls on the name of Jesus, you are the light of the world. And he's saying your job, your primary function, if you're wondering what your call is, if you're in here and you're wondering what your purpose is, your purpose is to shed light in such a way that you scatter darkness in the city. Your purpose is to illuminate the goodness of God in this world. So that's God's plan. When Jesus comes in and he says, be healed, his plan is for that healing to fill anyone who is willing and able so that it becomes in them a well, a wellspring of eternal life that is bubbling up from inside of them, that their life begins to be blessed in such a way that it bubbles over to the surface and it becomes a blessing to other people. Therefore, that is why the way we live matters. But it's because it's through surrender that we gain authority. We gain authority to walk in the power and live in the plans that God has for our lives. Because what good is salt if it's not salty anymore? And what good is light if it's hidden under a bowl? And so as we uh, close out here, I, I don't know how to do this, but let's take, take a moment of reflection. And you can receive this like as a prayer posture. Um, or you can just sit and listen. 
But I want us to look and think honestly as a church because we're, we're, we're here for the fullness of life. And I think sometimes there's that disconnect between the way we're living and then the way of Jesus. And not sometimes, right? That's all of us. That's a journey. It's a formation that we're on. But I also want to remember this. At this, this moment, as you approach your heart and you begin to look and you begin to reflect, it's never about condemnation. It's always out of desire to be set free. Never about condemnation, always about freedom. That's why we're here. That's why we do church, right? That's why we do it together in community so we can build one another up, encourage one another, strengthen one another, help each other walk in the way of Jesus, do it in relationship and community because that's the very fabric of what God created us to do and be so that we all can be healed, so that we all can live the fullness of life, that we all can be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to pray for a moment and then I'm going to share something. Holy Spirit, we invite you here in full measure. God, we, we open up our hearts and our minds right now. God, we, we receive that it's not out of condemnation, but out of freedom that you want to set us free. There are things you want to do today that are going to relinquish greater freedom. My church, I, I know there are people in here who are longing and asking for more, who have been hungry for more, who are seeking and wanting more. And I believe the response for something more, even though it seems so supernatural and miraculous, is a lot more practical than a lot of us are realizing. So Holy Spirit, would you come and bring healing and freedom in this moment? And I've, I've been praying, and sometimes you, you know, we have these amazing mountaintop experiences like some people had in these last weeks, or what God is doing through Wellspring, and we're starting all these services. And man, think people, God is doing something. And I've been praying into it, and I got a bunch of just like a sense of really practical things. So I'm going to share those. Um, I was kind of hoping they would be like more cool and fancy, but these are the words that I, I on my heart. I just think there's some people here that um, need to cancel their Netflix account. Okay, you need to cancel it. And maybe that sounds silly, but it's like, and, and, and your Amazon Prime. And maybe you paid for the whole year, so you're like, oh, that doesn't actually make fiscal sense. That's not responsible. Like, no, just cancel it. Because for whatever reason, you're longing for more in your life, but you keep going back to that, or you keep finding that, and you still build your life around that process. And then God's saying, no, just cancel it. Just cut it off. What would, what would really happen? <laughs> this one I want to share is like, I think there's someone here um, that needs to stop watching The Bachelor. I know that was silly. I didn't want to share that one, but I do mean it, that you're longing for more and there's fullness in your life that you're longing for. And you actually are great. There's even anxiety moments and you cry out to God on your knees. And in the meantime, you literally form and shape your life around when that show is coming on or you're living vicariously for the things relationally that you want in your life. And what would happen if you literally just stopped watching it? Who cares if you don't find out what happens? I'm sure you're here for a friend. What if you don't watch the rest of the episodes? What happens? What are you shaping your life around? What are you pursuing after? Some people here need to cancel some apps on your phone. You know the apps right now that you need to cancel and you need to just delete them. And then you need to tell a friend that you deleted them so you have some kind of accountability not to download those apps again. And it may not be some dark, scary app. It may be Instagram or Facebook. A few more um, un uncool words would be, um, I think some, some here may need to give a gift anonymously. Like, for whatever reason, you know you've been supposed to give generously, but you've also been waiting to give this gift, and you're actually, I, I think you're being called to give it anonymous, anonymously. So there's not even that, like, added benefit of it being a tax write-off, which there's actually nothing wrong in whatsoever. But it's actually, God's saying, like, I want to I take you further. And so for, it's not even about the write-off. It's about you trusting me and letting go. And other people, I don't know about this, but maybe it's just about giving in general. It's like that taking God at his word about the 10%, about the giving generously and about giving financially, that there's this tie to money that we have for trust. You're like, I'm all in on you, God, but I don't trust. And then for some too, I think there's just areas of, of just confession as a whole, of, of addiction, of things that you've been holding on to in our church. You've been trying to white knuckle or that you're managing okay, but you want that full and complete freedom. And I just promise you that full and complete freedom will not happen from you just doing your best to try and do it on your own. Don't do it on your own. Jesus wants to set you free. Every time you approach the throne of Jesus, he gives you mercy. 
every time. He's not giving you judgment. He's giving you mercy. So he's saying, no, don't hold on to that. Quit holding on to it all on your own. No, bring it to me because I'm going to wash it clean. I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk with you. I don't want you to do it on your own. You can't do it on your own anyway. Look, church, I know there's people in the church who are longing for authority in their spirit. The, the spirit. You want to walk in the power of the spirit. You want to experience the fullness of life, but you have to surrender the actions of your life over to Jesus. I think God is asking for us to make a move as a church. There's this verse that I think is for us today, and it's a harsh verse. It says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That's for some of us today. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. God's healing our church because I believe he wants to use this church. I think God is healing some of you today because he wants to use you. There are places in your life or in your past that are going to come uncovered. There are areas in your life that you may see as weakness or not your most flattering places. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, not only wants to wash that clean, but he wants to use that very place. He says, I want to use that very place of weakness, that very place of brokenness, and show my power and my strength through it. That may be the very place that you minister from. Since it's like God is saying, I'm calling my people back to myself. That God is proclaiming, I think even through the beauty and the goodness of what he's doing in the life of this church and this people, he says, I'm calling my people back to me because I have a plan. I have a move of healing that is coming and the time is now. And so repent. Repent, no more holding, like burn the bridges back. Maybe that like the deleting of that or doing those things is, is burning the bridge back to that thing. He's like, cut, cut the cord, you know, cut the rope. Jump out into the sea. Cut off that last thing that's holding you back. Come to me. The time is now. I have a move I want to do. And I don't want you like the ship sailing, the ship setting out to sea. And I want you on it. So cut the rope. Cut the rope. I just want to, um, Jesus, I, I, I just ask, Lord, that, that you um, burn out every part of anything that I said that is not from you, that you don't want uh, shared, but that those pieces, Lord, that you are longing to form us, Lord. We humble ourselves as a community. And we say, God, we do want more of you. We do want to step into that fullness of life. We want to see your goodness in the land of the living. We want to see your freedom. We want to taste and drink and never be thirsty again, God. We want that to bubble over, over the sides of our walls, that we live lives with a purpose and meaning that brings love and healing to the rest of the city, God. It's a cry of our hearts. Would you come and wash us clean? Call us into your beautiful and perfect place. In Jesus' name, amen.